Hi everyone! Today we will rediscover together some well-known quantities and principles in electricity. Through this video, many fundamentals will be reminded and solid mathematical and visual demonstrations will be presented. So, if you are interested in the journey, stay tuned! Let's consider an ideal generator producing an alternating voltage around zero at some frequency omega. The function for voltage is then V max cosine omega t. Now, we will add a simple resistor with resistance R to our circuit. If we connect the generator to the resistor through lossless cables, current will start flowing through the resistor according to Ohm's law. So as voltage alternates around zero, Electrons are pushed and pulled through the resistor without any lag. We say that the current and voltage are in phase. So our question here is, how much energy is transferred from the generator to the resistor during these cycles? Okay, let's start by plotting both voltage and current of the resistor. As we just saw, these two variables are two in-phase sinusoidal functions. Power at any instant is the multiplication of voltage and current. And because they are in phase, they always have the same sign, either both positive or both negative. So power will always be a positive sinusoidal function with double the frequency of current and voltage. Okay, good. Now, say we position a line at some instant T0 and want to sum the energy absorbed by the resistor during some period of time. Because energy is the sum of power times time, that would give us the surface under the power curve during the period of measurement, or integral of power over the period T0 to T. If we multiply and divide this integral by the period of measurement, we can identify this part here, which is the definition of average power. So, energy absorbed by the resistor between T0 and T is the period of time times the average power. We can also show this visually. Let's start by plotting a horizontal line at average power. This line slices the surfaces into upper and lower parts. We can now rearrange the surfaces to get a rectangle of width t minus t0 and height equal to the average power. Perfect! This means that the average power is enough information to know how much energy is absorbed by the resistor. So instead of handling a sinusoidal wave varying with time, we can just track the average value. But in electrical engineering, we work a lot with current and voltage. So can we also find averages for these variables to avoid using sinusoidal functions and still conserve the energy transfer information? The average power is the average of voltage times current during some period of time t. The formula for average values is the integral from 0 to t divided by t. Ohm's law states that voltage is equal to resistance times current. So let's replace current by voltage divided by r on one side and then replace voltage by current times r on the other side. We get two different expressions for average power. If we multiply the two expressions, we get an expression for the average power squared. Now we can simplify r and then apply the square root to get back to the average power expression. We can see that we have a first expression that depends only on the current and the second one that depends only on voltage. Perfect! We have two mean expressions for current and voltage 
and when we multiply them, we get the average power, which, as we just saw, is what matters after all. This is what we call RMS values for voltage and current. And it's because for both these variables, we apply root on the mean of the square of the variable. Root means square. We now have a clear definition of RMS values for current and voltage. RMS values for voltage and current are equivalent DC values that would deliver the same average power to a resistive load as the AC voltage and current do over one complete cycle. Let's go back to our previous simple circuit and add an inductor with inductance L. When connected to the voltage source, current will build up and down in the inductor as it sums voltage over time. And because integral of the cosine function gives us a sine function, current in the inductor will lag by 90 degrees the voltage. So now we have two currents, one in phase, feeding the resistor, and one out of phase, magnetizing and demagnetizing the inductor. The total current is the sum of these two currents. The in phase one, and the out of phase one. This sum gives us a cosine function lagging by some angle phi depending on the resistance and the inductance of our circuit. We saw that the RMS values can tell us how much energy is transferred on average to the resistor, but we also need this phase shift to know how much magnetizing energy is going back and forth between the inductor and the source. How can we do that without having to keep the whole sine wave? We start with our voltage and current. Now let's focus on the current. Using trigonometrical formulas, we can expand cosine of omega t plus phi. The minus here can be written as i squared. Now look closely. This looks like two real parts and two imaginary parts multiplied together of this complex number and this one. Writing this complex number's multiplication and retaining the real part yields the same result. Now if we apply Euler's formula, our current becomes the real part of the multiplication of two complex numbers. Hmm. This looks somehow worse than working with the sine waves, but bear with me, things will become much simpler by the end of the video. Let's take it to the complex plane now. The first complex number is I max exponential I phi of angle phi and magnitude I max. The real part is I max cosine phi and the imaginary part is I max sine phi. The second complex number is exponential I omega t. This one has a time dependent angle of omega t, a magnitude of one. The real and the imaginary parts are the sine and cosine waves of angular frequency omega. If we want to know how this complex number behaves with time, we should calculate its derivative. We can see that it's the same complex number multiplied by i omega. Now multiplication by i in a complex plane corresponds to a rotation by 90 degrees. This means that at any instant, the derivative of exponential i omega t will be perpendicular to the vector itself. And by pulling the vector perpendicularly, we get a circular motion at constant angular speed omega. Good! 
Now, what happens when we multiply the two vectors together? Using exponential characteristics, the angles will add up and magnitudes will multiply, which gives us a new vector with the real part corresponding to our original current cosine wave. And this vector will also rotate as time goes by. Cool! Now here's the trick. What if we started rotating the whole grid in the same direction as the vector? Well, as the rotation speed of the grid rises, the vector will start to slow down with respect to the rotating grid until we get to the speed of the vector, at which point the vector will appear completely still in the new reference system. Okay, let's stop rotating now. The angle in this new grid is now simply phi. We got rid of the time dependency. Isn't that great? This vector here is what we call phasor. Even better, we can change the magnitude from max value into RMS value. This phasor now will capture the power information through RMS magnitude in the inductive or capacitive behavior of our circuit through phase shift phi. This is often all we need to fully study an electrical system. We started with voltage and current waves that are time dependent and would consume a lot of resources to manipulate or to simulate. And now we have our phaser that doesn't depend on time and only varies when power transfer or inductive and capacitive behavior of the circuit changes. And this is why RMS and phaser are essential in electrical engineering because of their efficiency 